G'day guys, I'm Joel, Principal Advisor. And this is Arnie, uh, Tax Professional. And this is Money in the Tank. Uh, on today's episode, uh, which we hope you enjoy, we'll be covering off on five key areas to get yourself from the basement up to the ground floor in preparation to be ready to invest. So things such as getting your debts in order, getting your cash flow sorted, your budget, creating an emergency fund, and how to increase a bit more of your personal income and how to improve that situation for yourselves. Yeah, and then we delve into a few good Q&A questions, which are pretty broad, so um, keep them coming and maybe try and make them a bit more specific if you can, so we can give you some better general uh, in nature advice, and we've got another good 50-50. And uh, I just wanted to say to the listeners, we appreciate all the feedback. If you guys want to add any comments or questions or suggestions, then you can find us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It's at Money in the Tank for all three, and you can also drop comments on the YouTube channel. Uh, any like or subscri- subscription would help us, so we appreciate it. Thanks all. All right, Jolie, welcome back to Money in the Tank. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, good, to, good to hear and see you again, Arndog. Yeah, mate. What's uh, What's been going on? I know I saw you last night. We had a poker game at Jolie's, but what else have you been up to for the long weekend, mate? Yeah, we had a, a nice stay in the city uh, with Ez for her birthday, which was great. So we went to a couple of restaurants, one on Hosier Lane, which was a cool Mexican joint. Uh, stayed in, in Cram with the kids and the missus as for a birthday, uh, and then happy birthday as 35th. Um, and then we uh, <laughs> on Saturday night we went out. Oh, sorry, Friday night we went out to um, a place in um, what street was it? Lonsdale, I think it was called Mamak, which is like a Melbourne sheep eats place. It was just a Malaysian restaurant. It was awesome. It was one of those sort of textbook BYO places, uh, really good Malaysian food. And um, yeah, we brought a few drinks in and it was just a good vibe in there Friday night after work drinks. It was nice to see the city getting up and about again. And uh, we ordered a bit of a dessert thing for us. I had some candles, so we got got the happy birthday going with the kids and like the, the whole restaurant got into it, which was awesome. So um, <laughs> everyone started seeing it. So she was incredibly embarrassed, but um, it was good, man. And then uh, and then we, then we saw your uh, friendly face last night at my place. Oh man. I can't tell you how good it was to catch up with you and the boys because like compared to your week, I've had a shocking week. You know, I told you a couple of weeks ago, like we had some sickness through the house or we had it again. Charlie, my my oldest boy was in hospital during the week with um, croup and like a stridor. He was struggling to breathe. He's all right now, but it was stressful. So seeing the boys for poker was a good unwind. Yeah, that's good, man. And it had been like 12 months since we've been able to catch up. I remember it was pre-COVID last time we did a bit of a poker thing and... uh, yeah, it's great to get together with everyone. Yeah, so last night at the poker table, Jolie, you brought out uh, the physical copy of Rifkin's Rules, Rifkin's Rules, I should say, and I was so impressed with it because the first time I've actually laid eyes on it that we've decided to make it the unofficial Money in the Tank Bible. And Jolie's going to hit us with a pearl of uh, wisdom from Rifkin himself every week. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go and pick yeah, it up, I think Rifkin's you got brought up because one of the boys had a cigar last night, so uh, I think someone saw it and called out Rifkin's <laughs> Rules and... Uh, and I thought I'll bring the book out, I'll bring the physical copy copy out. Um, and I actually haven't looked at, through it for a fair while, but it's literally full of quotes for the first, I don't know, like 130 pages just about him giving quotes. And then there's just a bit about the author at the end. So it's really just about him, this book. It's quite funny. Um, but it's just full of these pearlers quotes. And I thought I'll I'll start with one, which is not, not, nothing to do with stocks. It's just him with a photo of some um, um, Budweiser models. And he goes... Uh, he's got his cigar in his mouth and a wine. He just, I just love being surrounded by beautiful things and people. Renee Rifkin, <laughs> nothing to do with stocks at all. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, rule, rule one, one. Rifkin's rules. So maybe we might be able to actually get some stock um, recommendations or something from him at some stage. But um, yeah, I thought I'd have a laugh for that one. But there seems to be a lot about him in here, which is quite funny. Um, anyway, uh, that the is boys so are, good. The boys enjoy so the front good, cover of the uh, the book there. I love that. Rivkin's Rules, that's that's my new favourite opening segment <laughs> for us. I can't wait to hear next week's already. Um, <laughs> we'll do it. We'll do it. So what, well, the topic we're going to cover this week is like uh, we've been focusing on investment the last couple of weeks, property and shares, and we actually got contacted by um, one of our listeners and gave us some feedback and said, you know, appreciate what you're doing, but we would also really enjoy if you could take a step back and give us some basics if you're not yet ready to invest, if you're not in a place in your life where you need to invest, um, what should you be doing to get there? So we've put together like our sort of top five things we think people should be working on. It's not uh, the complete list, but Jolie and I are going to run through them. So I might kick us off, Jolie, and just say that I think the the main one you need to do if you're um, getting yourself or trying to get yourself financially fit is to do a budget. And I know we talked last week or maybe a week 
to go about um, the barefoot method, which is the reverse budget, which is the buckets. But I think for this example, you actually need to do a proper budget. And I like to go to the Money Smart website, ASIC Money Smart website, where you can download or you can just do it online. You can put in your revenue, put in your expenses. It's quite thorough. But there are other apps out there. I think there's one called Mint maybe, but you know, you just pick, get a free app and just start doing a budget. And that's the first step because when you know where your money's going to, then you can start to um, address where you can rein it in and, and allocate it to other things. And I would say as well that um, with the budgeting, it, some of the uh, banking apps also do this for you. So I think I think Combank maybe, but correct me if I'm wrong, Jolly, where you can, it'll just allocate your expenses for you. And then over time in your banking app, you can just see where they go. Yeah, I think the, the, the banking apps do it in a, in a way. Uh, I don't tend to use them as much. I sort of, the Money Smart Calc's great because you can save it. You can go back to it. I use that with my clients and, and we tend to proactively plan things. So you try to create things automated and try to create proactive plans around it, which is where we utilize um, strategies and bucket strategies to work cash flow, because that way you're not always retrospectively chasing back, you're chasing, you're moving forwards and you're planning ahead. So I think that's really important when you're budgeting to try to get your head around it, but then um, yeah, create something that's going to be achievable and create uh, create a plan around that. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I think you need to do both, but I just feel like looking looking backwards first and then looking forward. Correct, yeah, looking backwards to get a picture of where you're at and then uh, planning forward because then you're not chasing your tail the whole time. Uh, when you're looking backwards retrospectively, it's already done and dusted. And you get to see you get to see where you're allocating a lot of your capital, you know, like, you know that ad where they're like ordering Thai food and they spend 400 bucks for the week and it's like, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's true, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a good one. And I think that sort of leads us to the next one, which Jolly's going to give us an overview of, which is debt. Because the reason you would start your budget is because typically people have some kind of debt and um, some debt's, you know, worse than others. Like I was saying, a mortgage is pretty par for the course, but do you want to walk us through it, Jolly? Yeah, so you've got good debt, bad debt. Uh, so good debt, yeah, things like uh, pro probably your principal place of mortgage debt is not too bad at the moment, really, and interest rates are so low. So... Not bad debt to have. Uh, investment debt is is what's considered good debt because it's deductible, uh, which we can cover off in greater detail in another episode. When you talk about investment uh, debt, borrowing to invest it, it's deductible against your wage and you're actually buying an asset that you're hoping will grow over time. So there's some examples of uh, debt that's actually not bad. It's, it's, it's good debt to have. Uh, and then you've got more bad debt. So debts like your, your, your payday loans, your interest rate, uh, sorry, your uh, credit card debt with, with high interest rates, your your personal loans, um, your, uh, your your afterpays and your zip pays. Again, you know, if you've got outstanding debt, really hard to track those sorts of things. So they're, they're things like your bad debt when, you, when you're talking about an overall um, debt position, Arnie, or when you're looking at tidying up your debts. Yeah, and I think one thing to focus on with debt is, and this is just my own personal view, uh, like everyone can make their own assessment on this, is but the, the main goal is if you're, if you're in a cash flow negative position, if there's more money going out the door than you're bringing in with debt, then your number one goal should be to get that to zero. You want to be making the minimum payment on all debt uh, without, you know, without having money go negative, you know, every every month. You don't want to be rolling debt to debt, basically. Yeah, it's not a position you want to be in. And when you're trying to tackle debt, Ideally, you want to try to tackle the highest interest rate debt first. So that, that'd be your, your payday loans or your credit card interest rates. They're usually upwards of not 18, 19, 20, 21%. Um, you know, never use your credit card for, for cash advances or purchases because they, they charge at a, high, at a higher rate. So you ideally want to try to tackle those higher interest rate cards first and then work your way down to your lower interest rates and try to physically... Uh, make it when you make it occur try to physically have something occur at the end of it so let's say you pay off a credit card that's just been hanging around on the five thousand dollar mark for, for for a long time and you've only ever been able to pay the minimum repayments now that you've knocked it off you know go out of your way to potentially cut that card up and remove it from your life because it may be something that you can't handle a credit card at this stage and you may eventually come back to it later but you don't necessarily need a credit card to be able to create um, you know, create financial stability for yourself. And it might not be a point in time when you want to use your credit card anymore. So if you do manage to pay it down, potentially rewarding yourself by just getting rid of it, you know, cutting it up and physically seeing how successful you've been at getting rid of a, a card like that. Yeah, it's powerful. It's a powerful thing to just take it and cut it and say, I don't need this. I think um, you touched on the avalanche method there, which is picking 
the the debt with the highest interest rate. And I know that uh, some people who I've spoken to also like to tackle a few of the smaller debts, maybe not the highest interest rate debt, but tackle a few of the smaller ones just to get a roll on, clear them. I, I mean smallest in terms of balance and um, get a few of those debts off the books and that way they, they, they feel a bit better about it. But yeah, I still think the avalanche way that you're talking about, like tackling the highest interest rate debt first makes sense because once that's out of your way, you'll have a bit more uh, room to breathe. Mm, and it's a psychological thing too, Arnie. So getting a win, getting a, a win on the board, so to speak, of getting rid of that, you know, that debt that was sitting at your afterpay, let's say it was sitting at 800 bucks, you know, getting rid of that and closing your account off or, or, or just completely, you know, getting rid of it and putting the account on hold. And then you've got a win on the board and then, okay, well, I'll tackle the, the credit card now that's sitting at four grand, you know, I'll get, I'll get rid of that next. But, you know, at least you get a win on the board and it's a psychological win for you too, um, which is which is great. So that probably then brings us on to our next area, Arnie, which is your, your emergency fund and your cash flow. Yeah. So I'm a big advocate for getting, a, if you can, I mean, not everyone can, but I think getting three to six months in an emergency fund. And again, this is not like barefoot specific. He does advocate for this. He calls it mojo, but I think a lot of financial um, self-help books and probably advisors would advocate that you should try and get three to six months of your living expenses into an emergency fund that you don't touch. And I would say, and I'm curious to hear what you think, Joel, I think once you're getting your, your debt payments to like you're meeting the minimum, I would say that this is more of a priority than actually paying off the debt. I think you should, if you can, try and get an emergency fund in place first so you've always got something to fall back on and then start paying down the debt. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's always a really hard one. It's a bit of a conundrum because the emergency fund's really great to have, but then you it's it's then you sort of just continually pay money off during that that period of time when you're trying to accrue that account. Um, if you can get the account established, you know, rather quickly, then that that's okay. But if it's going to take a bit to establish the account, then you you know you're still paying a lot of interest out over that period when you you know if you've got a credit card and you're only repaying the minimum, let's say but you're building up your emergency fund, but that credit card, you know, continually every month is hitting you for a few hundred dollars of interest. It, it does take away. Um, so it's a real balancing act. Um, I think I, I'm sort of, yeah, I, I, I try to clear the debts first. So I'll probably we, we, we differ on this one, but obviously trying to create a bit of an account so you've got some confidence there and then really focus on that debt. And then once that debt's extinguished, then really build up that emergency fund is probably the way I tend to take it. But um, you, you, it's, it's okay to differ on this because it's it's definitely um, you know not, not set in concrete. Well, I think it actually comes down to, well, in my mind, it comes down to whether or not your cash flow is going positive, which is what you were going to chat about next as one of our steps. So because if, you, if you've got a significant cash flow going positive and you can tackle a bit of the debt and you can put something in an emergency fund, that's ideal. Not everyone's in that space though. So I would say if you're leaning more towards, you know, not cash flow positive, you're going to have to tackle the debt first. There's no other way around it. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, cash flow then comes into play and in, in allocating your cash flow, as we said before, to specific areas to give yourself goals that you want to achieve. So then you, you've, you've set yourself up, you've come from, you know, we, we're talking about the ground floor, which is, you've come from basement level two uh, in a bad position, you've worked your way up to the ground floor or, you know, just getting to the ground floor and it's like, okay, well now we've got some cash flow work and we've cleared up our debts, we've got our budget in place, we've created a bit of an emergency fund. So what can we do to start making this cash flow work as well as possible. And then it's about, okay, well, let's allocate it. Let's sort of keep the habits, you know, that we've been able to try to create, let's keep them in check and let's start working towards something. So you start ticking off specific goals that you want to try to create or achieve, whether they're investment goals or whether they're personal goals between yourself or your partner. And you, you, you're having these tangible goals. So you might have some short-term, some medium-term and some long-term ones so that you're getting some wins along the way and that you're also having something, you know, an eye on the prize for a medium or a longer term goal as well. Yeah, I think so. And our last one is kind of a big one. So we could probably allocate a little bit more time to it, but it's basically once you've done, once you, if you can get yourself in a position to achieve those first four steps, the next thing you want to try and do is boost your income and cut your expenses. So we're going to talk, I guess, at a higher level about what are some of the things you can focus on and Immediately, my mind goes to like, if you want to boost your income, you can either try and get a side hustle or you could ask for a raise at your job, or you could try and seek out extra training. Like maybe it's going back to school, but if you're in a position where, you, you know, you don't want to be spending a lot of money um, on a certification, you can try and find 
affordable, like professional certifications that will help you boost your income. Could be in your chosen field. It could be in a field that you want to go to. So that's, that's where my mind goes to in terms of that. Um, have you got any thoughts about yeah, boosting your income or, or cutting your expenses, Jolie? Yeah, definitely. So rather than the old famous words from one of the previous, I think it was the shadow tre treasurer who just sort of said off the cuff, well, if you can't afford something, get a better job. Um, <laughs> Joe Hockey. Joe Hockey, that's right. The old famous, and I remember a Batuta Advocate one, which was great talking about, a, I think it was a, um, a labourer going, oh, I'll just become a surgeon. Um, it was quite funny. They <laughs> took, took the mickey out of hockey, which was great. So uh, rather than just saying, get a better job, folks, we'll actually you know suggest a few things that you can do, which... Um, which is great. So there's a lot of free resources, a lot of help resources out there as well. So really, you know, delve into Google and check what's out there from a government standpoint and, and a help standpoint, because things like improving improving your CV could be a, a great one. And it can sometimes be done at a fairly cost effective level, um, improving, as Arnie said, some quals, so qualifications, whether it's a TAFE course, I know there's some incentives out there at the moment, um, whether it's a you know bachelor course or a degree or a postgrad course. Um, whether it's just adding extra licenses or adding extra, you know, um, strings to your bow from what your current job is. So maybe you're, you're working in a, in a commercial or a factory setting, getting your forklift license, just some extra things which makes you more employable and potentially helps, uh, helps you with future job prospects. Um, and then, yeah, going, going to your employer or whatnot and asking, you know, is there, is there an ability to promote uh, to get promoted within uh, look at different job opportunities or ask for a raise um, sometimes people are too shy to ask for a raise but it's one of the quickest and easiest ways if you've been you know if you feel like you're really good at your job and the employer values you then uh, yeah you you go up there and the worst they can say is no and then you look at your other opportunities out there to see if there's other you know potential work situations at different um, different employers yeah I would also add to that that when you're thinking about improving your resume or going to get other qualifications, you might come into the situation where you actually get an interview at a, at a new job that you want. And there's a lot of good resources online about preparing for interviews as well that talk you through how to dress, how to answer the questions in a format, like STAR is a big one, which is addressing the, the interview question with the situation, uh, the task, the action, and the result. And, and that's in the example that you give. So that's just one method you can use, but there's a lot of good resources out there that are free uh, that will, it will help you improve on that. And you can do some mock interviews as well. Mm. And they always like to hear real life examples. So not fictional things, not made up things of I'd do this in this situation. They want to hear what you've actually done. Yeah. And like you can use any example too. Like you just might be like, it might be someone who's just out of uni. If you haven't got much work experience, you can still apply it to like a uh, group work in uni or, or school. Like you can still have something like that to answer the question. Yeah, so I think a future episode we might be able to get someone, a uh, HR recruiter on and, and talk about some of the things to prepare if you do start looking around at different opportunities. And, you know, your, your one main um, thing in life is your ability to earn an income. So you need to, um, you know, max maximize and make the most of that, but also find, you know, with something that's enjoyable and something you're passionate and you love doing, you might you might give up an extra pay rise to stay at a place that you really love where, what you're doing. So that's really important as well. So, um, yeah. Be mindful of that. Um, a few other things we jotted down was just uh, living within your means and making sure that you're allocating. And, and once you set yourself up, that you're you're working towards something and you and you're living within your means or have some um, frugalness around certain areas. Um, so yeah, there's some of the main five uh, five tips I think that we we spoke about, Arnie. That hopefully um, covers a few broad areas and brings people from, as we said, the basement up to you know ground floor to get themselves prepared for the next stage of the journey. I know about your household, mate, but when it comes to being frugal. The place where Kate and I started all those years ago was food. Um, and it's like become a bit of a cliche, you know, you don't buy your avocado on toast when you go out to the cafe or whatever. But like if you make meals at home, you do more meal planning and meal prep and you get a bit savvy with, you know, uh, the cheaper cuts of meat and ways to bulk prepare things, like you can save a lot of money and eat some really delicious food as you get better at cooking. I think that's a massive one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Preparation, planning, yeah, really key. And, Absolutely. you know, just touching on that as well you can also get like good stuff from like op shops and things like if you don't have like all the cooking gear that you would need to get better at cooking you can get like affordable stuff uh, pots pans good knives and stuff that might need to sharpen or whatever but you can get them from from uh, op shops and things like that so there you go how diverse are we Arnie? we can we can supply people with places to shop and uh and food preparation as well we might even we might even do a breakaway podcast arnie's cooking cooking yeah, I, um, show <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do a vlog get me on video it'll be like yeah 
<laughs> Take follow the, you to the op shop, getting your getting your gear and preparing your cuts of meat. I'll sharpen the knife. I'll clean the pan. <laughs> love it, love it. No, um, that's good. I think. Um, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's all we wanted to touch on for those five steps. But I think those are important ones. Um, so that sort of leads us to Q and A for the week. So maybe I'll ask the first question of you, Jolie. Um, one of the questions we got asked during the week was um, our thoughts. So I guess I guess we'll both answer, but our thoughts on investing in startups. So it was kind of a vague question, and I know there's a couple of different answers here. So maybe I'll let you answer, and then I'll jump in with anything I've got as well. Yeah, I'll probably let you take the reins on this one because I um I only I think I only found out about this one this morning that I've forgotten about it. But um, <laughs> yeah, right, start, startups could be your public listed company. So I think always with startups, you you know if something's getting floated, you've got to keep an eye on what the company is and how well you think it might do. Probably one of the ones that comes to mind from a few years back was Medi Medibank Private. Um, that was a government run um uh, company and uh, had you know, big footprint and I guess, you know, looking at what they could do to improve it when going privatised, usually they're able to, um, you know, minimise some costs and um, in, improve some e efficiencies. So that's just an example of a floated stock that came from a, um, a publicly, uh, sorry, a government owned stock to a, a publicly, publicly, publicly listed company. Um, and that's an example of a, um, a, a new floater, a new stock coming to market. Um, as a not a startup, it was an established business. Um, startups, yeah, startups are probably uh, a little bit different in that regard. That you're you're getting in something on the ground floor, or getting something early that you you might have seen or read about or heard about. Well, that's what I was going to differentiate between because like this question is so broad. Because when the person who asked this question, who I think it might have been my cousin Mark, like I think when you're talking about investing in startups, uh, do you mean like just you know you investing in the Money in the Tank podcast, which you know we'll happily accept uh, any equity donations or equity investors but the other the other type is what would be known as uh, a sophisticated investor and to be a sophisticated investor in australia you need to be you need to have an accountant certify that you either earn two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more per annum for the last two years or that you hold net assets of at least 2.5 million and then once you are certified once an, an accountant certifies that you're a sophisticated investor uh you I think it's like a two year period that you have where you have to make um, an investment. Maybe you have to, actually maybe it's two, it's valid for two years. You need to get it renewed every two years. But then when you are um, certified, you need to make your first investment within six months. And if you are a sophisticated investor, you might get opportunities that other people don't get like pre IPO offers or property syndicates or hedge funds or unlisted securities like private companies who want to raise capital. Um, because not everyone is able to invest in those, uh, depending on what stage they're at on on their journey. So, yeah, investing in startups—it's a very broad question, and it, it kind of two different trains of thought there. And there's a lot of um, people that earn a lot of money that I wouldn't classify as sophisticated investors. So it's quite <laughs> funny how they put an amount of your income or your assets on that title being a sophisticated investor, because uh, it doesn't always uh, match up. You know, one cool story about this is um, there's a, a YouTube channel I follow called Hyperchange and shout out to Gally. I don't know if you'll ever hear this. I'm a bit of a fanboy of his, but he actually started this business. He's an American and he started a business called Guap, like G-U-A-P. And it's uh, what he's trying to do is get people who are like the equivalent in America. I think they're called accredited, accredited investors or something like that. And he's trying to get people from all over the globe who can put pay money into his um, fund and then he's going to go and seek out these private equity investments and he's basically just trying to open up that market away from like the big boys and bring it to the smaller people i know i know that like 250,000 or 2.5 million in assets is a lot of money but compared to some of the hedge funds who typically get access to these things it's like it's smaller in that in that regard compar comparatively yeah yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? And um, I think there's some pretty cool podcasts out there on angel investors and whatnot. And, you know, there's a lot in America that will throw a bit of cash at uh, startup tech companies, hoping that one hits. And if one hits and they're in the right, you know, they're in the Ubers or they're in, uh, you know, your PayPal's or whatnot early days, it can uh, really help you. But there's probably a fair few swings as well. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, that's some examples of startups. Um, early day, early day investing in a company. The other question we got, so I'll throw this one to you to start with, Jolly, but we can both have a crack at it, is uh, this comes from Cappy. He was asking us, what do we think about ever-increasing house prices in Australia, and do we think that's good or bad for your average Joe? Yeah, 
great question. Um, and just be mindful to um, try not to generalize Australia as one big property because it's, uh, as we mentioned last week in Property 101, uh, as podcast, if you haven't listened to it, jump back and, and check it out. Um, <laughs> general in nature as always when we're talking about uh, advice or, or, or just investing in general. Um, Australia is yeah, made up of a bunch of different markets. So you've got um, different states, different um, uh, cities, different uh, suburbs and regions, uh, and they all move differently at different times. So, uh, when we're talking broadly about Australia, obviously, you know, the last you know six months it's it's boomed along. Um, you know, probably one of the first times ever it's all gone at the same time, and everything's been in positive territories. But they do tend to move differently. Yeah, that's right. So I guess I think he was probably talking in terms of uh, Melbourne and Sydney. Melbourne? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so Melbourne and Sydney having some um, having some run and, and and just jumping back to the the property podcast, we'll probably we had have, have had some great questions on the property podcast and some good feedback. So we'll probably try to do another property, maybe not one hundred and one, we'll call it one hundred and two <laughs> uh, podcast in the future, and we'll we'll cover off a few more areas because I think it is fun and people do uh, tend to resonate. It does tend to resonate with people uh, in Australia because it's um you know it's a thing that people tend to aspire to or want to look at. So. Yeah, we'll cover a few more off, but um, yeah, some pros and cons, I guess, of, of house prices rising. So we were chatting before, Arnie, and, and, and it, when you get a house, uh, getting growth in an area, let's say Melbourne as an example, you start to build uh, what's called equity. So the difference between your loan and the actual property uh, price is um, what it would sale for is your equity. And the banks will generally lend up to a certain percentage, um, which you can then utilize that equity for, for growth or further, uh, further outcomes of return. And then, uh, Arnie, do you want to explain the, the, the um, I guess you can explain the magnifying outcome of that or the, the, the I guess, the, the other side of the coin where you're talking about the cost of entry? Yeah, well, you, you were talking about equity and that's exactly right. Like, I think that is the, one of the big pros is that anyone who's invested in Sydney or Melbourne in the last 10 years would have seen some significant capital growth and therefore they've got extra equity that's available to them. Now, what they do with that equity could be a pro or it could be a con you know if you take out that equity and you spend it on i don't know a fancy car that doesn't do anything then maybe it's a bad decision but if you take it out and you use that leverage to invest more money uh that could potentially be a pro because you're going to be generating cash flow and you and i were discussing this prior and um i think that is one of the pros in one sense but it could also be a con yeah so if you've got 40k uh that you want to invest in shares and you've got 40k that you could invest in a property and if you're going to earn a 10 percent return on the share money then you're going to get four thousand uh four thousand dollars or if you have a, a mortgage down payment and you can somewhere find a house that's worth four hundred thousand dollars and you buy that and then you get 10 percent uh, appreciation in capital growth then you're going to have made forty thousand dollars so you're going to get greater capital appreciation and equity through the leverage um, and that's one of the pros but the flip side to that is the con, which is the uh, the barrier to entry of cost. Like if you can't afford to save up 40 grand, then you're not gonna be able to do that. Whereas shares, you can get in for a lot lower um, cost base. You can maybe get in for a couple of thousand. So that's a pro and a con for each one. Mm, yeah, it's great, great to hit pit both sides of the coin. And yeah, obviously uh, the cost of entry is, is higher um, for the property and you can actually leverage into shares. You can borrow to invest um, shares and, and it is a high risk investment um, because if the shares the shares generally go up and down more over time and uh, you can get things called margin calls where you've got to make a call upon uh, the loan and, and pay some money back. But um, generally property is a bit more stable uh, over time. So it, it does help de decrease that risk a little bit as well. And there are properties around uh, Melbourne and Sydney, obviously a bit harder, but um, yeah, there's properties around regions and different states where you can get uh, you can get in at lower barriers to entry, but it's uh, not just uh, important to get in a lower bar barrier to entry because it's no use getting something for 400 grand that doesn't do anything over the next five or 10 years. You need to get in at a good area, but um, something that's gonna have some upside uh, growth potential as well. Yep. General in nature. I think when Cappy was talking about this, um, he was basically sort of saying like, do, do we think this is sustainable? And that's that's one of the worries that I've got is like, is what's happening in Melbourne and Sydney sustainable? Um, I, I don't like, what do, what do you think? Do you think that house prices can keep going up or what, what do you foresee? Uh, just your general vibe on it. Yeah, well, generally over the, the past 10 years, like Melbourne as an example, um, has a couple, of, a couple of periods of plateaus, but then it has some periods of growth. And I think Melbourne's only just getting back to where it was maybe three or four years ago now. So, you know, during that period, it had a dip and, and it had some plateaued period and then came up again. And, and Sydney, you know, has had a similar sort of journey. And even in the 2000s, Sydney from the Olympics to, I think it was like 2010, it didn't really do much. So 
Um, you've got to sort of average out over a longer period of time to get a, any sense of what things are doing. Um, and yeah, you know, prices become expensive and then the market does, you know, correct or adjust to that. Um, but when we're talking about, you know, governments, with your principal place of residence, especially Australia is set up in a way to really um, uh, help, I guess, that area. Uh, they do tend to help with stimulus and government grants. And it's always been one of those areas they try to promote because it does stimulate the economy, Arnie. Yeah, you and I were touching on that. So we've got that, that grant that recently came out where I think is up to $150,000 if you're going to add to an existing home or build a new home. Was that right? What it was when you get? Uh, yeah, the 150 was for a Reno or you know extension and to an existing, and then it was like 750, I think, or or a mill for a new home in total, maybe 750. We'd have to check on that. Don't uh, quote us. Just uh, a few grants <laughs> as an example. And you know, Victoria they they've done a, sta a stamp duty discount as well. Um, and you know they've stimulated new new home builds as, as well. For I think that's where the grant came in, and you get extra discounts for stamps on new home builds because. You know, the economy or the government always wants to see the economy, especially at the moment, rebound. Um, so the economy, they want to stimulate it because if you've got a new house that they're promoting to get built and you're going to get an incentive and in, in its first home buyer getting in, if they're going to, you know, build the house, you're going to get the all the fixtures and fittings and get the floorboards done and then the, the tradies are going to come, the tradies are going to work, they're going to earn money, spend it at the cafes and the coffee shops <laughs> and, you know, uh, use that, that money to then flow onto something else uh, and then your home furnishings, you need to fit it out so you're going to have your appliance stores getting wins. So it does tend to... Anytime the government's looking to try to help spur the economy on, they do tend to direct it to that property market, not just to see the property prices growth. Um, they want to see everything else get a win out of it. But um, the property prices growth does give people confidence, that's for sure. See, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, I think that was sort of where Cappy was coming from. And I think, I wonder if that's sustainable. Like, I wonder if we can keep just throwing money at increasing property prices or having incentives for people to buy in and keep buying and keep buying. And then people keep getting this equity to, to bring out and you know to, to stimulate the economy can that continue forever without other things changing so yeah don't know enough about it but i sort of i wonder as well if it's going to cause long-term pain mm, yeah we might see shifts in people and spread populations spread out to regions and different satellites satellite cities getting set up where it's cheaper cost for entry but they can you know create uh, their environment around there that's their own city so they don't you know they move out further and further and you know places like frankston are now a satellite city um you know bendigo geelong ringwood you know there's all those areas that have yeah that, that's just we're just broadly talking general pop property sort of stuff but yeah it's an interesting one to be you know brave to bet against it as well um oh, yeah know, the RBA as well controls things. The, uh, for those that don't know, the Reserve Bank of Australia, it's separate to the government, so they actually control what's the, in the interest rates. So they they do um, control a bit as well in terms of their interest rate mechanisms. So if they choose to look at start raising interest rates, then that can um, potentially slow things down or they can um, change some regulation with the banking uh, lending restrictions, which they've done before, that can slow things down as well. Um, they can put different onuses on investors. So there's a bunch of different things that can occur to if they need to try to slow it down. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting one, but interest rates are at all time lows at the moment. So that's you know one of the reasons the properties um, had such a, uh, having such a good run is because affordability for property in terms of um, repayments has, um, you know, it's the best it's been for a long time because of these low interest rates. Um, but yeah, a con of that is interest rates will eventually rise. So it's going to be, you know, you're going to need to have um, some pocket money put away there to ensure that you've got enough in there or you're, you're calculating yourself in at those higher interest rate repayments. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good attempt at answering Cappy's broad question. So um, yeah, yeah, keep the questions coming in. They're great. I really yeah, appreciate we appreciate it. them, guys. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's awesome. It's good to be able to do, you know, 20 minutes on some info stuff and then um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes on some Q&A stuff, which uh, everyone wants to hear because um, those questions that come from Cappy or you, you, um, whoever it was, the other person, but they're people, um, they're, they're, they're listeners. And um, I think generally the audience that will be hearing that will think, oh, I'd I wanted to know that. So that's great. I'm glad someone asked it. So, um, yeah, and I've uh, we've got a few more that we'll be able to cover in the next few weeks too. I'd also encourage anyone to hear us with their own opinion on that topic because it is a divisive one. I'd love to hear what the listeners have to say about, you know, do they think that ever-increasing house prices are good? Yeah, interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so this week, got a great 50-50 topic for you, or either or, or uh, what would you rather? <laughs> um, Looking forward to it. And the reason we do it, Arnie? Because Money in the Tank wants to highlight that each individual is different and everyone's going to have different prior, uh, preferences and 
um, choices they want to make. And that's important because everyone has different styles of approaching investment and approaching personal finance. So Jolie and I typically tend to disagree on a lot of things, but I think that's what makes us uh, good mates. So yeah, I got, a good, I got a good one for you this week, Jolie, and I'm going to, it's coming at you cold. So Jolie hasn't been prepped for this iPhone or Android and why? Okay, yeah. Well, I've never really gone down the uh, the Android track, so I've been iPhone since day dot. So back in the old iPhone four days, I think it was, or threes, maybe back in the day. So um, yeah, I've only ever known the iPhone. Uh, previous to that, I think I had um, I can't remember what I had now, but I, the only thing I miss about it is I, would, I was able to touch type when you had the actual buttons there. You knew where your fingers were, so you could text really fast. So <laughs> I felt like I was a bit of a pro at that. But then the uh, the smartphones came along and you sort of lose that uh, ability a bit because you can't really feel where the buttons are anymore. Um, but yeah, I've always been Apple. I love the podcast on Apple, but you know, you can get podcasts and everything now, Spotify and whatnot. But um, yeah, I've just sort of stuck with them. Uh, brand loyalty, but un, uh, un, un, sort of unbiased brand loyalty. I've just been there and I just haven't, haven't moved to Android for no particular reason. I'm Android all the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought and, you might be. I thought you might be. I, uh, I, thought, I thought you might be iPhone. And I wonder, like, I, I think I'm Android because... You, you touched on brand loyalty. I am so anti Apple because I don't <laughs> I don't want to be like I don't want to be like buying into their ecosystem because then once you got the iPhone you got to buy all their other shit. Yeah, yeah. So that's sort of how I feel about Apple. It's maybe maybe it's a stupid bias. Like maybe I need, just need to try one because I've actually never tried one. I should say you're fighting and, back. You're fighting back against the big corporate giant. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It's like well, they, they, Goliath. They originally, they're, they're, if you haven't seen it, check out their original ad from the Super Bowl back in the 80s, I think it was. Their, their big thing was the, the new kid on the block trying to smash the big like the big IBMs, your big corporates, and now they're the big corporate that uh, <laughs> they, you know, they're fighting, you're fighting against them now. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting how their journey's progressed over time. Apple from a small right. little company to uh, with only a small market share and fighting against the big players like IBM at the time to being the big player that you're fighting against. They're the big dog now, but I do feel you on the on the typing on the keys. I used to have like you know the old Nokia with the yeah, snake, yeah. showing our age a little bit. Missed that. Yeah. I missed that. No, but great. And yeah, personal preferences in life, personal preferences in investments. So it's all uh, par for the course, and everyone has their different selections. So we'll have to get some Zoom polls happening on Facebook once we can work out how to do it and uh, and hear from people about uh, all those. Uh, what's your choices and fifty fifties? Because we want to we want to hear from the people what uh, what their choices are when it comes to phones, when it comes to uh, chicken and cheese twisties uh, or ham <laughs> hamburger. I think I saw a cheeseburger at the shops today. Uh, we'll have many many good fifty fifties to come. I've actually thought of a couple of good ones for coming up so we'll uh we'll throw those out at the end of the podcast to uh keep it light and have some fun yeah i love it we'll throw all the old ones up too once we work out how to do it on facebook i mean we could do it but once we work out how to get some actual results up there love it crew all right on dog we'll uh appreciate uh, appreciate the catch up today as always my friend and uh thanks everyone for listening in uh this is money in the tank uh enjoy and uh, until next week and keep all the feedback coming we love it cheers mate bye guys see you crew